I ask you if you would please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. We'll be looking at verses 25 through 27. John chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is come into the world. Let's bow together. Father, I ask you to take us to this moment that we might uh, just in our hearts understand these words, understand the circumstances in which they were shared, and understand the power that they contain. Lord, we're reading your word to us. We're reading and seeing the words that you spoke in that day, and it's recorded that we might have it. And in having this, Lord, may we in turn come to a moment of decision where you asked, do you believe this? Lord, help us to know whether or not we earnestly believe that you are the Son of God, the Messiah who has come. I pray for everyone in this room today. Speak to us through these words in Jesus' name. Amen. These words are recorded in a very heartfelt moment. Lazarus had died. Jesus had purposely tarried and waited until he knew in his heart that Lazarus had passed. Then they made, the disciples and Jesus made their way there. Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, were grieving. Their hearts were heavy. And when they confronted Jesus, they basically told him, Lord, if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. Now, folks, when death visits, it brings those types of emotions. I don't believe for a moment that Jesus was threatened or even troubled by what she said. Uh, he was confident in his father. He was confident that Lazarus knew who Jesus was and believed on him, that Lazarus had died and gone to be with the Lord. But he took that moment with the questions and the grief and the sorrow and the pain, and he asked a question. And this question is so relevant for us today. He asked them if they believed. He made a statement, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me even if they die, yet shall they live. And if you believe in me, you will never die. Folks, do you realize how powerful those words are? For the one who believes in the Lord, let me let, me let you know something. Everybody in this room is going to die unless Jesus comes back. That's the one thing. If he comes back, and I wouldn't mind that, and I think we're pretty close to it. Amen. Uh, uh, and we, we'll get to uh, enjoy something that nobody else does. But let me just tell you this, that if, if today the Lord called me home to heaven, if today I left this place to be with him, let me tell you something. I believe these words that Jesus said. I believe in Jesus Christ. I've trusted him. I've repented of sins. I've placed my faith in him and him alone. And I believe that if my number is checked in today, and I leave this place that I will, we're going to use the word death. Brother Bud has died. You'd call everybody and say, hey, Brother Bud preached it. Now he's gone. But listen, I believe what Jesus said. You will never die. So what is death to the believer? And this message isn't about death, but what is death to the believer? To the one who trusts in Jesus, death is a portal. It is a doorway. We leave here. We go there to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And there's great hope in that, folks. Paul tells us there's no pain in death of the believer. There's no suffering in death of the believer. Jesus taught that we'll be ushered into his presence by angelic hosts. I mean, just imagine that. 
That's all I can do. I've never done it, so I don't know. But I believe every word that Jesus said. And I'm going to tell you, as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you today that everything Jesus ever said is validated in the fact that he claimed to know that he was dying and then he made the claim, I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take my life back up. He shows us that he has authority over death. Folks, if I said that, y'all would run out of here and say, Brother Bud has lost his ever-loving mind. <laughs> hey, I, if, if I die today, I'm not going to stand here and tell you, I know I'm dying today and I have the power to lay my life down, but I also have the power to bring my... I, I, that, if somebody starts talking like that, get away from them. But I can say this, if I die today, I have trusted the one who has demonstrated the power over life and death, who is able to lift me back up in that day in which he calls all the dead in Christ to come forth, just as he called Lazarus in this day. And this is where the miracle of, of Jesus calling Lazarus from the grave, and just, just to look at the timeline of the life of Christ, this miracle is so irrefutable this really begins to pave the way for him to be betrayed and eventually crucified. He is turning his heart to Jerusalem. This is a pivotal moment. But in that moment, now he's raised others from the dead during his ministry. But in this moment, he demonstrates something that is so powerful. They had buried Lazarus. He'd been in the grave for days. He called for the stone to be rolled away. He called Lazarus to come out. And Lazarus came walking out. You know, he wrapped him in... And he came walking out in those grave clothes. Now, folks, I'm sorry. You cannot refute that miracle. I don't, I don't care who you are or where you come from. If you see a guy that's been in the ground for a few days, walking out in grave clothes, loose, no putrid. Matter of fact, even the sister said, Lord, I mean, he's smelling by now. I mean, it was just all of this, just the reality of it. And you say, well, preacher, I don't know about that. Well, let me tell you about one greater than that. Jesus is going to die on a cross. They're going to prepare his body. They're going to bury it. They're going to go in three days, and that tomb is going to be empty. And then the believers in Christ are going to see him. Paul said at one point 500 believers saw him. It was an irrefutable fact that Christ came out of the grave. He was seen and then later ascended back into heaven. And the angel said, this same Lord that you saw go is going to come back in like manner. Folks, listen to me. The power and the reality and the truth of the resurrection is the exclamation point of our Christianity. Paul said, if there be no resurrection, we are a people that are most miserable indeed. Why? Because we have believed a lie. And everything we do is based on a lie. No resurrection, there's no hope, there's no nothing, folks. So the resurrection is pivotal. Here Jesus makes a statement. Now we call these the I am statements of the Gospel of John. The God, by, by the way, if you've never read your Bible and you want somewhere, people always say, well, golly, it's a big book. It is a big book. But if you want somewhere to start, I always direct people, just read the Gospel of John. And even if you don't believe in Christ, and even if you might be here today and you're a skeptic, just do this. And it's just a challenge. It's a simple challenge. Read the Gospel of John and just voice a little prayer each time before you read and say, Lord, show me who you are through your word. That's, that's all the challenge is. I've never had someone take that honestly and not become a believer. So you know, some of them it took a long time to get there, but they got there. It started, though, with that searching and seeking. In the Gospel of John, the I am statements that we see are, are pretty interesting. Uh, he had in uh, chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In uh, chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, verse 7, he said, I am the door. Ten, in chapter 10 also, he says, I am the good shepherd. Here he says, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, he's going to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in, verse, in chapter 15, he says, I am the true vine. And the point is, he said, I am, and I am equates him to his father in the moment with Moses and to the Jews and especially the leaders. When he made those claims, they were blasphemous to them because he was equating himself to God. So that's why we call them the I am statements. And all of these are powerful. I may do a series of messages on them where we cover each one. But today I want us to look at the resurrection in life. So, so in that moment, he looks at, at the sister, one of the both of it eventually encounter him. 
But he says, I am the resurrection, and he says, I am the life. And I want us to think a little bit about the importance of the resurrection to the life of, of you and me as believers. And if you're here today and you're not a believer, in other words, you've not come to that point in your life where you have repented of the fact that you're a sinner and that you're separate from God and that you need grace and you need salvation. And by conviction, you're coming to the Lord just as you are, not with any bones about you, not trying to imitate or pretend. You're just coming like you are, believing uh, that He is the Son of God, that He died for you in your place, and that His blood paid the price and the penalty of our sins that we might be forgiven. That's, that's, exactly, that's the gospel. But I want you to understand that the resurrection is the key to all of this. Now, Jesus had said that I'm going to go away. And then he plainly said, I'm going to die. He also plainly said that just as the temple, like if he died, the temple will be destroyed, but it will be gathered back up and rebuilt. He claimed, of course, that for himself. So Jesus made a promise that I'm going to die, but I'm going to take my life back. I'm going to live again. Now, if he can make that promise and keep it, and he did, then any other promise that we find in Scripture is validated and made real in the fact of the resurrection. The, the, you hear me say all the time, is this a promise to claim? If there's a promise in Scripture that we can claim, we can claim it based on the, the fact that it's God's Word, and we can claim it on the fact that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and was resurrected. And He said He would be, and He did. He kept that claim. He kept that promise because He had power to. Folks, we can bring our needs to Him and believe that He's able. It validates us as Christians, okay? There's been no other that has made the claim that Jesus made. Only Jesus said that I'm going to die and I'm going to take my life back up. And only Jesus is the one that did it. Now, His resurrection was not like Lazarus. Lazarus is going to be called from the grave. He's going to live again, but the life that he's living is similar. He's reanimated. He's going to die again. The resurrection of Christ is a resurrection from the dead with a glorified body that's eternal. It's the same body that you and I will have when we're resurrected. So, so the fact that Jesus Christ was able to do that and the only one who did that validates his claim that he's the Son of God. He's not just somebody who is uh, mentally challenged or warped or, or uh, has a, a, a complex he said these words and then he demonstrated that power. So it validates Jesus as Messiah. That Jesus had power to be able to, to raise himself up from the dead tells us that he's going to have the power to raise us up from the grave. And any loved one that we have lost in Christ, he will raise them up from the grave. And that's our hope, Christian. We live in a fallen world. And in the fallen world in which we live, death is a part of sin. Sin came in and it decimated us. And it has all the issues. The, the people say, if God's so loving, why does this world have such bad things? Sin. Sin. Sin is why there's violence, sickness, illness, death, suffering, pain. All of that is because sin entered the picture. Jesus is the remedy for that. But sin is what we see so many times. That Jesus is able to, to be raised validates that one day we will be raised. And we will, okay? Uh, the resurrection obviously proves that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. And then we read that this same power that brought Jesus from the dead, listen guys, is available for us. And it works in us. Did you know that? Let me give you a couple of verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, uh, this is just Paul uh, kind of praying and understanding. He said, He prayed that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what the riches of His glory are, the inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The same power that brought Jesus from the grave is the same power that is exercised in our lives. So listen, listen. Let's say, for instance, 
Uh, Brother Bud, would you pray for me? I've just got terrible habits in my life. I don't know that if I'll ever overcome these, these, these faults that I have. They just seem to overwhelm me. And, and you could pick any of the uh, uh, attributes of the flesh. It could be violence, anger, jealousy, envy, gossip, whatever it may be. You just feel like it's got a death grip on me. I'll never get over it. So if you'd have brought that to the Apostle Paul and said, Paul, would you pray for me that I can overcome these sins? Paul wouldn't lay his hands on you and say, oh, I pray, Brother Regan, that if you'll overcome this issue, Paul would say, Lord, I pray for Brother Regan that he would recognize that in him is the power to live above that. That power is in us to live victorious lives. We don't have to ask for it. It's there. So, so that's the working in us, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. Folks, that's just a wonderful thing when we think about it. We have victory in Jesus because Christ was victorious over death. That power works in us. Oh, that we might understand that. What needless pain we bear. It's not because we don't bring everything to God in prayer. It's not that we, we just don't believe. We don't believe. So I want to challenge you this morning to believe what God's Word says and know that the power that brought Christ out of the grave is working in you and I. It is obviously the working of the Holy Spirit that makes us like Him and molds us and leads us and equips us and empowers us to do the work of ministry. Not only is Jesus the resurrection, He said, I am the life. I am the life. Now He's been telling the disciples subtly but also very plainly that He was about to die. They're going to turn, I'm going to be turned over to the Jewish the leadership. They're going to kill me. I mean, you can't get much plainer than that, okay? I don't think they wanted to believe that. But, but he was claiming here to be the source of all life itself. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was an agent of creation. Everything that is created through him and sustained by him. So, so he has power over life. John chapter 10, this is, I've referenced this, let me read it to you. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to take my life again, or pick it up again. This command I have received from the Father. So he knows in his relationship to his Father. Now remember, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit distinct individuals are still one. So he can speak with the same authority as the Father. And, and it's, it's, it's the Trinity and the triune truth of who God is. But in here he was saying, I'm going to lay it down, I'm going to pick it back up, and this has been granted to me by my Father. So the hope that he had and the assurance that he had was found in the authority of the Father. He knew that he was going to be raised again as he yielded himself to go to the cross. He knew what lay ahead of him. He knew how bad it was going to be. He knew that it was going to be a torment. He knew that enough to pray in the garden, Lord, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But he also knew, nevertheless, thy will be done. He knew what he had come to do. He came to be the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world, and he came to suffer and die. He did that, and he did die, and he was buried, but three days later, he was resurrected. In John chapter 14, he says this, Because I live, you also will live. Do you see that? Because I live, you also will live. The assurance that we have in life is that Jesus said, Yes, we're going to die, or he could come back. If we're living, we'll be changed. But in the end, we're with him forever. And folks, I, I know, I love living here. This is everything I know. I love my life. I love the ministry. I love the people. I love my family. I love everything. I love the beautiful sunshine. I like cold weather. Uh, all of you people that think I'm crazy, when it's 105 degrees this summer, I'll remind you. Uh, no, <laughs> but it is a little nippy. But I love this, the beauty that we have. But can you imagine all the things we experience here for our lifespan? It may be 70 years, maybe 80, it may be 30, it doesn't matter. We're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell, but we're going to spend eternity there. And eternity is a long time. 
And that's our hope in Christ, to live with Him, okay, forever. So, so, and then John chapter 1 verse 12 says, To all who believed Him and accepted Him, He's given the right to become the children of God. And then John 3, 16, we all know it, don't we? Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now there's one more verse. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. That, that was His purpose. That's why Jesus came. He's going to come again and judge it. He's going to condemn it. But the first time He came was to save us. And the resurrection puts an exclamation point in that. He looked and said these words. And in those words, He used He and whoever. And I want you to see this again. I am the resurrection and the life. He or she, I won't leave any of our ladies out, he or she who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you, I want you to catch something in that, guys. The he or she and whomever. I want you to see the, the broad expanse of the free gift of eternal life that is offered to humanity. Now listen, I'm going to be a little straightforward for just a minute. I'm not prying. It is personal. I admit it is, but I just want to ask you a question. Are you at peace with God or is your existence on this earth seems to be tumultuous? Do you seem to go from crisis to crisis and peril and you're just not happy, you're not joyful, you don't have peace? You're not right with God, and you know it. Now listen, I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. Here's what I want you to know. Today, today, if you are here today, today you can come as you are to Christ, believing on His name, trusting Him to be true to His Word. You can ask God to forgive you of your sins and to save you and to make you a believer in Christ and to trust Him to do that. And today, now listen, your life may not uh, uh, turn over a new leaf as far as you have all understanding immediately, but you will be taking a step in a direction that will give you that new life in Christ and you will see the power that brought Christ from the grave begin to work in your life and you will reference it and recognize it for the rest of your life that Christ meant what He said. Whoever, whosoever, whomever, He she who believed. you understand that? It's that simple. It's that simple. The key is he or whoever believes in me. Believes in me. So what does it mean? It's not a matter of saying, okay, I believe Jesus is Jesus. I believe everything the Bible says. I believe this. I believe that. I understand there's, there's a mental belief. There's a mental ascent. You know, I believe it's cold outside. And, and, and Jared, you may say, I don't think it's cold outside. And we'll both walk outside and we'll see who's right or wrong, right? We'll, we'll let, okay. So we can have those statements. Well, I think that, but I really don't. And we can do that. Truth is the thing that matters here. Truth is what matters here, okay? And what Jesus said, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever believes shall never die. I mean, he made it so abundantly clear. To me, that would be what all of suffering from sin humanity should run to. I don't understand why anybody could not. It's just the most beautiful invitation and good news. And we have the privilege to tell people about it. I'll tell the world I'm a Christian. We have the privilege to do that and the glory of it. And we have the power to do it too because the Lord works through us just to be obedient to Him. Okay? So what does believe mean? Now, let me give you, in the Greek, and I'm not, I don't do this very often, but in the Greek, and go back into the original languages and you really dig into what they were saying, there's a few things that it means. It means to rely on Him and to trust in Him. Okay, so I'm not giving mental assent, just like I say, you know, I believe this and that, and I believe this. It's not that. It's I have trusted Him, and I am relying on Him. The illustration I've often used for this, just simply this. 
If, if you were in the middle of a lake and you were drowning and you were crying out for help and someone threw you a flotation device, whatever it may be, it could be a life preserver, it could be the ring, it could be a balloon that's big enough to hold, whatever, it doesn't matter. If they throw it to you and you grab a hold of it and all of a sudden you're not sinking anymore, you are going to cling to that. You are going to hold on to that. Nothing is going to separate you from that for that moment because that object is going to be the source that may absolutely save your life. And you're going to recognize that, folks. That's what it means to cling to, to rely on, to trust in. It is to hold on to Jesus, nothing else. Not a Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, religion, prayer, attendance in Sunday school, how much money I gave. It doesn't matter. A member of the church is holding on to Jesus. He's the source of this life. And it's just simply aligning our life and holding on to Him. And folks, I don't know about you, but when you and I say, I believe that Jesus is the resurrection and life, what we're saying is this. I believe that Jesus is alive. And I believe that He is going to return. I believe He's with us today. Jesus said in Matthew 28, And lo, I am with you always. I believe that. When I believe that Jesus lives, I believe that. Uh, when Jesus says in Hebrews, I will never leave you nor forsake you, I believe that. I believe there will never be a moment of my life that I'm outside of his care and outside of his hold. He's going to hold on to me. Well, what if I walk away from him? Where are you going to go? <laughs> where, where are you going to go? Well, I'll run away from him. He's everywhere are you going to run to. <laughs> I'm going to go hide in a cave. He's there. I'm going to close eyes. I can, he's there. I'm going to reject him and, and tell him I don't want him anymore. He's still going to be there. See, my salvation isn't based on my performance. My salvation isn't based on what I achieve. My salvation is based upon the fact that Jesus looked for me and he found me and he saved me and he holds me and he will keep me. That's my hope. How do I have this hope? in the power of the resurrection. He's able to, folks. He's able to. When I think about Jesus Christ and the power that he exhibited over not only death, but that he is the life, I can believe every promise. I said this a little bit already, but I can believe and, and hold on to that. I can do so with faith. I can have a biblical worldview where I see this world in a biblical sense not necessarily in a philosophical sense, which there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, we, can, we can discuss philosophy all day long. But ultimately, what I come back to is a biblical understanding of the world in which we live in, that God created, that He keeps, that He sustains, that He's provided for us. I believe that, okay? When I say that I believe in the resurrection of Christ and the life that that brings, I believe that death has really been defeated. And I do not have to fear it, ever, ever. I'm not looking forward to it, other than the fact that it will translate me to the presence of the Lord. I like living. I think everybody in here does. But when death comes, or I experience death in the life of, of my life with someone I love dearly, I can rest in the fact that if they were in Christ, it's not over for them that I'll see them again. I was at a funeral home visiting uh, a family prior to a funeral, and I was talking to someone about the funeral itself. And we were talking about the hope that we have in Christ. And folks, that is what Christians come back to again and again and again. I've heard members of our church tell me so many times, Brother Bud, I don't know what I'd have done if I didn't have Jesus. That's true. That's true. To have Him and to know Him means that we never have to fear. And then we have this gospel, the gospel, the good news of Christ. We have a gospel that proclaims the holiness of God. We have a gospel that shows us our wretchedness and that it took the life of Jesus' son to pay the price for our sin. We have a gospel that tells us that God loved us so much that he was willing to send his only begotten to be a savior. The gospel lets us know that the cross is the centerpiece of the existence of humanity. From the cross backwards to Genesis, we see the sin of man and the effect of it, and yet we see the grace of God culminating 
in one who took the throne of David. This is from the Old Testament, but it was Jesus. And then from the cross forward, we see the church in action and at work in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we've been living, so we really can't imagine life before that. But all of this is centered in the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. The gospel tells us that the cross is the absolute exclamation point of the love of God. For when we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God has demonstrated his love for us. Folks, it's a demonstration. The gospel tells us that the love of God and the wrath that had to be equated for, or at least it had to be substantiated, is done in the cross when Jesus died in our place. We have a gospel that calls people to turn from their life of sin and to have faith in Jesus. Not based on our faith, but based on the faith He gives us because the Bible says that it's a gift. We can't boast about it. It's all a work of God in our lives. And certainly we share a gospel that expects us to live like Christians, to be different in this world, and yes, we need that. When Jesus asked the question, do you believe, her response was, yes, Lord, I believe. That should be the response of everyone when it comes to the understanding of who Christ is. From the Old Testament, we see belief in action. The old, you, know, you know what the oldest book of your Bible is? I, I know we would say Genesis because it's the beginning, but it's Job. Job is the oldest book of our Bible. So from the oldest book of our Bible, listen to what Job writes. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job said, long after my body is returned to the earth from whence it came, I believe that I will stand in a body and I will see the Lord. Isn't that powerful? What an affirmation of faith. What Job is saying is, I believe. Now this was before Christ, but the belief and the faith that he had in God is validated in Christ. Remember, God is eternal. Psalm chapter 17, the psalmist says, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. What does that mean? Resurrection. When I am seeing you in a body that resembles you. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? That's a glorified body. Isaiah chapter 26, the prophet said, Your dead shall live together with my dead, uh, with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. I'm going to arise, the, psalm, uh, the, the prophet said. Daniel, Daniel, listen to what Daniel said in chapter 12. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. David, I mean, uh, Daniel is looking ahead to the time when all the death, dead will be called. There will be those that will appear before the Lord in judgment and then cast from His presence. These are the ones who never believed. And then there will be the ones who were raised, who believed on the Lord and trusted in the Word of God. And it was attributed to them as faith. And then based on the work from the Old Testament, what Jesus did for us from the cross forward, for us trusting in Jesus himself, we will awake to eternity with him. What a blessing. What a blessing. I want to close with just a couple of thoughts. Bear with me. When Jesus came to this earth to be born of a baby, we just celebrated that at Christmas. And in several weeks we'll be celebrating his resurrection, by the way. Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us for a specific purpose. Hebrews tells us what that purpose was. That through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to bondage all of their lives. Jesus defeated Satan and delivered the captives in his resurrection. 2 Timothy chapter 1 tells us that Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
When it says he abolished death, that means that he nullified it. He rendered it of non-effect and no effect. One writer said he's essentially put death out of business. So when we die in Christ, we will go straight to him. The Bible says that we would never die. I think there's more in those words than we'll ever understand, and we will understand it in the moment that we're called from this place. I personally think of it as Paul spoke of it. He said that those who sleep, those who sleep, and he was equating that to death, waiting for the resurrection. Folks, I don't know about you, but I don't think there's anything more calming and reassuring than to know that we sleep awaiting for the call to be raised. As you're here today, I don't know where you're at spiritually or where your journey is right now. I'm grateful that you're here today. But if you have not come to a place where you have just humbled yourself, and it is an humbling. It is admitting, I don't have all the answers. I don't have everything together. <laughs> Lord knows, don't we all know that already? But for some reason when it comes to spiritual decisions, we hold on to the last moment. Can we just come on equal footing this morning? We're sinners that needed salvation. Some have been saved. Some haven't. It's just that simple. Today, you can, right here, right now, bow your head and ask the Lord to be your Lord and your Savior. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon me, the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just that simple. A child can understand it. There's not an adult in here that can't understand it. The truth is responding to that call. I was reading the testimony it's actually folks that attend our church. The woman wrote a book, and it's a good book too. And it's how the Lord brought her and her husband to salvation. They had been attending church for a little while. The Lord was doing work in their lives. Morally, they were cleaning some things up, and uh, they had a lot of questions. They weren't religious people at all. They didn't know anything about religion at all. But the Lord had been picking away at them, just kind of, taking some of the reservations away. And uh, one Sunday, the preacher had preached a message about salvation, and the wife looked at her husband, and she said he had a hold of the pew so tight that if the sky would have fallen, he wouldn't have been torn away from that pew. I mean, he was holding on to it with everything he had. And she felt an urge to go forward. The, the invitation had been, come if you need to receive Christ, and, and they, just, they just couldn't. And they both knew that they were, I mean, absolutely being led to give their lives to Christ and had been so. This had been leading up. After the service, one of the older gentlemen from the church came up to them and she said with a very loud voice that everybody could hear, <laughs> he asked them if they had been saved and if they needed to. And they said they hadn't been saved and they wanted to and needed to. So she said they went into a room and he sat down and he explained to them, and I've mentioned it today. He explained that we're all sinners and that sin is separated from God and that Christ died to pay that penalty of sin that we might come to God as sinners asking him to forgive us and to cleanse us. And that day, the husband and wife both gave their hearts to Christ. And it's kind of weird from that day uh, later, I, I, I kind of went to the back of the book and I haven't read it all yet, but I was curious where this was going to end up, and uh, eventually the husband became a minister for the gospel. Uh, so the Lord had brought him full circle in his life, and uh, uh, she attends our church here. Her husband's passed away since, but it's a powerful, powerful word. Folks, listen, if I could help you understand salvation, I can't say it necessarily any plainer than I have, but I would love to sit down and take a Bible and share with you how you can know that you can be saved. And that will end that turmoil. Now, it's not going to end the problems of your life. It's not going to end. <laughs> Matter of fact, Jesus kind of brings some new problems. We've got to depend on him daily to live this life that he's called us to live. But it begins with a new birth experience. And if we're not been born again, we're not God's kids. 
It's got to be a work that he does in our heart. So I invite you now, and right where you are, let's bow together. I'm not going to ask people to raise hands. I'm not going to ask people to, because I don't need to know. Uh, it's, I think the Lord lets you know. But with heads bowed, if we might just come to him as we are. And if, if this is how you feel in your heart, maybe this would help you a little bit. Lord, I understand that I'm a sinner and that my sin has separated me from you. And I own that. I accept that. I also understand that sin leads to death and eternal separation from you. And I believe that. Lord, I believe that you came and you lived and you died for me and for all that are in this shape. And I ask you today, please forgive me of my sins. I turn away from that life and I'm turning to you, Lord. And I'm asking you this morning to save me. Lord, would you please save me today? If you've come honestly and humbly to the Lord as he has expressed in your heart a need for this. The scriptures say that you have been saved. The scriptures tell us that heaven rejoices. The Bible also tells us that we're to confess the Lord before men. And we're to let him to begin this life change in us from this day forward. So if you have prayed and asked the Lord today would you write it down somewhere so you can remember that? Would you search me out or tell somebody else, I ask Christ to save me this morning? And can we put a stake down whereby we begin to live this day forward, trusting and believing and relying on Jesus Christ? And that's the invitation this morning. It's simple. It's understandable. I'm going to step down to the front in just a minute. You might want to come and share with me that, or you may not. You don't have to. That doesn't, that's not a part of it. But I would like to know. Father, I ask you to honor the power and the presence of your word. And Lord, today, very possibly could be the first day of eternity for many that are here this moment. So I lift them to you, Lord. I pray that you might reveal yourself as only you can. Lord, we that are born again, thank you for this precious hope we have. We praise you for the resurrection. We thank you for what it means. Help us to believe it, to live it, to share it. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.